How are you guys? How are you all, how are you all doing? Um, I, hope you, I hope you've enjoyed your first day of Vox Days Belgrade as much as I have. It's been a really awesome day so far. Um, some really good talks. That last one by Yu Feng was really good too with the Google API stuff. Really interesting. Uh, before we get started today, a quick show of hands, a quick question. So who here either works remotely themselves or works in a team that are not all based in the same office? Ah, okay, so quite a few, maybe more than half, I think. Okay, that's good. And for the rest of you, I hope you take something away from this today to maybe change your answer the next time I see you. Um, my name's Adam. I work for a company called Atlassian. If you haven't heard of Atlassian, you might have heard of Jira or maybe Confluence as well. Uh, in Atlassian, I work in the Jira service desk team. And here is my team. Uh, so there's two people here I want you to meet first. Um, first of all, in the middle here is Princess Leia, also called Brad. And to his right is Guido. So these two guys are actually in my team, and I work with them day to day. So you'll see their names pop up uh, in, in later slides in the talk as well. Um, you may also notice that I'm not in this picture. And that's because my team are based in Sydney, but I am based in Europe, in the Netherlands. So how did this come about? It's a bit of a journey. It, it all happened last year. Um, so previously, I was based in the Atlassian office, the main one in Sydney. And last year, the, my team was expanding into the Atlassian office in Saigon in Vietnam. So I moved there for a few months, which is awesome. Uh, while I was there, I took a quick holiday. I met a Dutch girl. And I decided to move to the Netherlands uh, to live with her. <laughs> but I kept my same job, still in the same team as well. And now I work with a team that are between eight hours and 10 hours removed from me which is kind of a pain in the ass, but it's how it is. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about my experiences with this funny arrangement. Uh, I'll start with why I think you should work remotely, uh, or the problems I now see with co-location. And then the rest of the talk is going to be about my um, experiences and guidelines about working from somewhere other than your office, um, also working across your team as well. So why remote? Or what's wrong with everyone being together in an office? But first of all, I'm sure you've all experienced this at some time. Uh, it's really, really hard to get any work done in an office. Um, have you ever finished a day and thought, wow, I got nothing done today? It happened to me all the time in the past. In fact, I used to come into, into the office two hours before the rest of my team just to get some work done, which is crazy. It's ridiculous because there's too many distractions in an office, like, for example, Nerf gun battles. Uh, in Atlassian, everyone gets a Nerf gun the first day. These happen all the time, so it's not very good for a conducive focused environment. Uh, besides that, you have people coming to your desk asking you random questions as well, where you could have a big object graph in your head, a big problem you're trying to solve, and someone asks you a question, and it's like, poof, it's all gone. And it takes you 10 minutes to get back into that zone again. And there's also uh, problems with meetings that get dragged into that go on for too long and have no agenda as well. So it's very hard to get work done inside the office. But also, getting to the office is really bad for your health. Um, not only do commutes suck, they're bad for your health, but yeah, so first of all, actually, the only commute in my whole life I've ever actually enjoyed uh, was this one last year in Saigon. This was a lot of fun, uh, but even this has its own dangers as well. Like when you're turning left at a big junction and you're not really paying attention to where you're going and you hit a person in the back. Sorry about that. Um, but your commute also has its own dangers as well. So there was an article on Slate.com called Your Commute is Killing You. Uh, where they gathered various pieces of research from different universities. And they found that basically, the longer your commute, the greater the risk you have of developing obesity, insomnia, stress, neck pain, back pain, blood pressure, even divorce. Divorce, wow, that's really interesting. Um, so your, your commute is really, really bad for you. But inversely, the shorter your commute, then the less you die, pretty much, or get divorced. Um, so yeah, it's good to have a small commute, which is why working from home is a good thing. And the next piece of advice or why I think remote work is good is more for the people building teams or hiring. Um, so all of the best talent doesn't necessarily live near where your physical office location is. Some companies can afford to relocate the best talent if the talent wants to move. Most companies can't do this. So by forcing your staff to work from the same physical location, you're severely limiting your pool of talent that you can hire from. Say, for example, I want to start a company here in Belgrade. This is my catchment area for Belgrade. It's probably an hour, hour and a half drive. So everyone I hire has to live within this area. But if I, if I open up my, my hiring policy to remote workers, then here's Belgrade again. And obviously, the catchment area is going to be much bigger. Uh, so these are the reasons why I'm in favor of remote work. 
And so now I've shown you why being stuck in an office is not good. Um, I'll talk to you about working from home or remotely and the benefits that brings. So when I first got the go-ahead to work remotely in my team, I read some blogs about this, and they all pretty much involved a kind of a scene like this where you're on a tropical island in a beach paradise, doing some coding, doing some surfing, having a cocktail. It looked really nice, but I didn't move to a tropical beach paradise. I moved to the Netherlands, so it's more like this. But you know, at least this weather is good for coding. <laughs> and to be fair, it has been a good summer. This is a bit harsh in the Netherlands, but the winter does suck. <laughs> Uh, so let me, let me bring you through a typical day in my life as a remote developer. Um, don't worry, there's no pictures of me in my underwear. I do wear clothes when I work from home. I'll tell you why I do in a bit. Um, so yeah, I pretty much get up around this time. Um, I have a shower, I have breakfast. I start work around 7 a.m., so I walk seven seconds upstairs to my office, do some coding. Uh, because my overlap with Sydney is the first two hours or one hour or two hours of my day, I have meetings by VC as well. Oh, the clicker stopped working. Okay. Sorry about this. It's not going to the next slide for some reason. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes I have meetings. Uh, sometimes I leave my home and I go work in a cafe just for a change of environment. Or I can work by canal as well. I did it once. I couldn't really see the screen, but it was nice to be outside. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. There's nothing special about it, except that instead of coding in an office, I'm coding wherever I feel the most productive. I will go through the gory details of sprint planning and actual coding and that kind of stuff later on in the talk as well. Uh, so what's good about this? It's pretty much the inverse of the problems I mentioned earlier with being in an office. Uh, first of all, you really feel like you managed to escape the rat race. Uh, the freedom to work in cafes or share workspaces or anywhere where you feel the most productive, it can really provide extra energy and inspiration, and it's a really good thing to have. Next up, and probably the best benefit of this, is the focus time. So because you decide which interruptions are worth breaking your flow for, because all your communication is, is from tools, not in person, uh, you really have these long stretches of focus time, which are really, really valuable. And finally, we've already seen how commutes are bad, so less commutes are definitely a good thing as well when you're remote. But it's not all good. These are the kind of things that when you, when you go online and research remote work, it's usually the good things that you hear about, but not the bad things. So in the past year, I've encountered some problems and challenges that I didn't expect to find. And the first one definitely took me by surprise, and that's loneliness. I didn't realize just how much I'd missed the casual office chats about pretty much anything. Uh, you're quite isolated when you work from home all day, especially for a few days in a row. And I'll talk more about how to handle this in the next section. The next not so good thing is the time difference. It can really suck. Uh, this varies depending on how far removed you are from your team. Um, for me, it means that in the middle of winter, I start work two hours before the sun comes up. Um, this picture behind here is actually my hometown um, when I start work. That's how it looks. So it's not very nice. You can also kind of feel out of sync with the place you live in as well. So if you had a social event, having some beers, normally you must leave earlier because you've got to start work earlier than everybody else the next morning. Uh, so that, that can be a problem as well. Our next up is communication. Uh, so some people don't check their messenger or the chat apps that often, which can be infuriating. Uh, sometimes a three-line conversation can take three days, and that sucks as well. Um, but yeah, so it's not a good thing either. But still, I think having said all this, having taken the pros and cons in balance, I still think the pros of working remotely totally outweigh the cons. And that's why I'm now going to bring you through my tips and tricks of the working from home trade. So the first piece of advice I have for you is to keep the work part of your house separate from the living part of your house. Uh, it's really, really good to have a separate work area, like a separate room if possible. If you don't have this, then it can cause problems, especially if you have flatmates or you live with a partner. When I first went remote, my apartment in the uh, Netherlands didn't have a separate room for working in. It meant that for the first two, three hours in the morning before my girlfriend went to work, she couldn't watch TV, she couldn't do certain things because I was in meetings in the corner of the room. Yeah, it's not a very practical way to live, especially for her. Um, and if you have a separate work area, close the door when you're working as well, just to really keep that separation of your home life and your work life. Even though you're in the same building, it's really important to keep that. Sometimes it is hard to explain this separation to certain parts of my family, no matter how much I explain to them. But you know, at least with this distraction, I can pick him up and move him somewhere else. In an office, if your manager comes to your desk, you can pick him up and move him somewhere else, but it's not the best career move I find. So yeah. 
Next piece of advice is to actually wear proper clothes when you're working. Uh, don't work in your underwear or pajamas. It's not just for personal hygiene reasons. Uh, it's also good to take advantage of a thing that scientists call enclosed cognition, which basically works like this. Uh, it's been proven by research that the clothes you wear can actually shape your thinking processes and your skills and actions as well. Uh, so if you wear a white lab coat, then you more, you're more likely to think like a doctor or a scientist. If you wear a football jersey and training shorts, you feel more athletic and active. Uh, if you wear a functional programming t-shirt, then you're, you're probably going to think that functional programming is the one way to code and everyone else is wrong. Um, I wear an Atlassian t-shirt when I work, and it works well for me. And I wear jeans or shorts as well. The same as in the office. This piece of advice is kind of a tricky one to get used to when you first start, remote, for, first start working remotely. So um, it's really, really easy to fall into the trap when you work from home to go and cut the grass or to do the laundry or clean the house. Um, but yeah, it's not really a good idea to do this because you're at work. So in your working hours, maybe at lunchtime it's OK. But in your working hours, it's really important to stay focused on what you're doing for the day and again, keep that separation from your home life. Um, it's really easy to fall in the trap of watching TV or being lazy like that. But yeah, over time, you get better at this, and it becomes a really, really important discipline to learn. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind. So the most important thing, the most important piece of advice I will give you about, about working from home is regarding mental health. So it's important to, to mind this, whether you work in an office or at home or wherever else. But you do encounter different challenges and obstacles when you work remotely. Um, so I mentioned this took me a bit by surprise when I first started. So my tips to keep your mental health in check when you're remote are, first of all, to make sure that you switch off from work when you've done your work. There's a huge temptation to keep working past your usual hours because you're trying to fix a bug or you're trying to solve a particular problem for a customer or whatever else. Um, but if you wouldn't do this in an office, don't do it at home as well. Just because you haven't got a commute, it doesn't mean you should work longer hours. You're still working your regular hours, and keep that in mind. Um, now when I finish work, I close my door to my office room, and I don't go in there until the next morning. The best way to switch off from work is to completely focus on something else, um, like a hobby, for example. So I love soccer. I love traveling. Uh, I live in Europe now. So last June, I, I was able to combine both and go support Ireland at the European Championship Finals in France. Uh, as a picture of me and my girlfriend and my two most Irish-looking friends. But yeah, for these two weeks, I completely forgot about work, and I came back refreshed and re-energized, which is what a holiday is for. It's what a weekend is for as well, or even an evening. So keep that in mind and try and find something else to keep you engaged. Exercise is more important than ever when you work from home. It's important if you're in an office or any time as well. But the problem is that if you stay at home all day, you get less incidental exercise, like walking to the train or wanting to catch a bus. Um, so it's important to compensate for this by doing something. I currently kind of suck at this. I do run sometimes at lunchtime, but I should do more of it. But it is important to keep in mind. So I mentioned earlier that you do miss the day-to-day -day interactions and chats in an office. Uh, in fact, a few days in a row being isolated like this, you go a bit mad. So when I first started working from home, I found myself going down to the shop in the corner just to chat to the cashier. I can't speak Dutch, so it was a limited conversation, but it was better than nothing. And um, in the end, I used to count the seconds until my girlfriend came home from work, uh, meaning when she came in the door, my face kind of looked like this. So. <laughs> It's probably a good thing for her, or maybe not, I don't know. But yeah, tackle this problem head on. Um, this is not my dog, um, but it, this is my cat who you met earlier. This is Tommy. Uh, so getting a pet can actually help for some company when you're at home all day by yourself. You have someone to talk to. Um, so it's a really good thing. I, I know a guy in, in Melbourne who works remotely for Atlassian too. He got a dog for exactly the same reason, just for some company when, when he's at home coding all day. Um, it's also good to get out of your house or outside as well. Uh, go find a local cafe. Um, this is Chummy Coffee in Leiden. And the owner knows me pretty well by now. I'm there all the time. And it's a different kind of conversation to when you're in an office, but it's a pretty good substitute as well. Um, another really good option is to consider a co-working space near where, you, near where you live. I personally don't do this. I cheat a little, because Atlassian has an office in Amsterdam, which is just about close enough to commute there occasionally just for social interaction. So I go there on a Friday, usually just to have some beers after work, which is nice. Um, but most people mightn't have this option available. So the option to use co-working spaces is actually a really good one. Uh, so there were some studies done by Harvard Business Review where they found compared to office workers, the people that use these spaces see their work as more meaningful. They have more control over their jobs. And they feel a part of a community as well. 
So it's a really good option to have. Uh, if you want to start with this, then a lot of cities have dedicated websites for finding these spaces. And there are services you can join on a subscription basis, like WeWork, where you can actually register and use offices all over the world, or hot desks as well. Uh, there's even a co-working manifesto. So there's, there's a really strong sense of community with these co-working spaces. The next piece of advice I have for you when, you when you work from home is to make sure that you do stay engaged and keep having the chats about tech stuff and find somebody to have this with. Because uh, you miss these conversations that you have in an office about general topics, not just the day-to-day -day work, like the new version of Gradle or the new uh, or Docker, for example, or other things too. Um, if you don't have those chats day-to-day, -day, you're reading content, but you're not really processing it properly, because it's good to have these chats with other people. Um, so the best way to do this, I find, is to become a part of your local tech community. Go to meetups, go to user groups, go to conferences like this one as well. And that's a pretty good substitute for having these conversations in your office. And finally, I'm working from home. So by exclusion here, I mean that in the office, you will miss these ad hoc tech discussions that happen where something important is decided, because not everything is a scheduled meeting, and you won't be involved in every discussion. So before, you could have been used to that. But when you're remote, not in the office, you are excluded. Accept this. It's going to happen. It's one of the drawbacks. Um, but you can still have an influence. Um, so one strategy I use is I pick an area of our dev process in our team I didn't like, and, and I own that, own that, and I basically created a guide from my team. And yeah, now everyone from our grads to senior devs use this guide, so I still feel like I'm having some kind of an influence over more than just my immediate workspace and my team, um, so it's a nice feeling. So it's a good substitute for having an influence in other areas. So a quick recap on working from home. You escape the rat race, you get extra freedom and focus, um, but at a cost, but the good things are still better than the bad things, in my opinion. Working from home, treat your workspace like it was an office is the simplest way to advise this. And finally, managing mental health. It's even more important to do this when you're remote and make sure to stay engaged as well. OK, now I'm going to share my experiences and advice on working in a team remotely. Uh, most of this advice also applies to distributed teams, geographically distributed teams. Like last year, I was based in Saigon. My team worked with the team in Sydney a lot as well. So the most important thing in any team is communication. And when you're remote or when you're in a geo-distributed team, asynchronous communication is a primary form of this. And by asynchronous, I mean it's where you detach sending your information from receiving. Uh, so you have time to think before basically replying to the message or sending a message, so email, chat apps, uh, and comments on pull requests, et cetera. Um, conversely to that, synchronous is the old-fashioned way. It's like a one-on-one -on -one conversation, like meetings, uh, where you walk, people come to your desk and have a chat as well. Um, and with these, it's pretty much you think about ideas, you iterate on them, and you process them at the same time as others. And often, at a time, it doesn't suit you as well. So remote work means far more asynchronous communication. And now I'll show you why that's actually a good thing. So first of all, with async communication, I mentioned before you decide when interruptions can actually stop your flow. That's a really, really cool thing to have um, because you can have long periods of focus time, which really help if you're a developer and you have deep thinking processes. Next, next good thing about this is that typically you have a history as well. If you're using a chat app or email or anything else, you can search and work out why six months ago you decided to use Scala and Java together or stuff like that. That can be really useful as well. And finally, and most importantly, I mentioned that you have time to stop and think before you reply to either a question or a request or whatever else. And usually it means that you have a better kind of conversation flow because people think through their answers far more thoroughly before they reply and don't just blurt out the first thing that comes through the head, like what happens in meetings, et cetera. So async is really more effective, too, for those technical discussions around architecture or solution design, I find. And the most well-known tool for async comms is email. Except email doesn't work very well for team collaboration, because everyone gets a personalized view of the world and of the shared content for a team. And if someone new joins, then all your emails they don't have. And yeah, it's, it's not very good for that. And we don't use email much at Atlassian. In fact, my inbox on a typical day just looks like this, pretty much. All I have is notifications from Atlassian apps, nothing else. Uh, so luckily for me, it just so happens that my company makes tools that do greatly assist async communication in development teams. So this is Atlassian's mission, to unleash the potential in every team. And this includes remote teams as well. 
So now I'll show you how I use Atlassian tools for communication with my team when I work remotely. Um, so the first tool I use is HipChat, which is Atlassian's messaging app. It's good for general coding discussions or discussions about pretty much anything. Then we have Jira Software, which is our agile planning app, which is good for discussing a particular bug, epic, or story in context. Confluence is a collaboration platform. It's good for high-level architectural discussions or team practices or that kind of stuff. And finally, Bitbucket, our code hosting service for discussing code in pull requests. So with HipChat, actually in past companies, I've used Google Talk and Skype. I'm sure today a lot of you use Slack as well. Um, or Atlassian, I use HipChat, of course. And it's really, really, it's super useful in an asynchronous context because you can ask them a question when they're offline and then get back to you when it suits them when they get up in the morning or whatever else. Time zones don't really matter. Um, so yeah, it's really good for that, for one-on-one -on -one chats and also for rooms as well. Um, we use rooms a lot at Atlassian. Um, it's basically a chat with multiple members. Uh, in my team, we have a team room. We have a, team, a room for discussing code for a particular office location, for social events, et cetera. Um, so yeah, it's really useful for that. One really, really useful feature as well at HipChat on your remote is the concept of app mentions, where you can bring the attention of a message to a particular person or people. And if they're offline, whatever else, they can get an email notification about this. So when they're back online, they know they have to get back to you. Um, there's also the, you can also do the same thing, but for everyone in a room as well to make announcements like, hey, we base on master, that kind of stuff too. That's really useful too. The next tool we use is your software for keeping track of tasks and sprints. Uh, so a Jira issue, which you see here, it's an item of work to be done. You've probably seen these before, maybe not. But in this case, it's a story. And here you can see that I mentioned Guido. And I told him that my work might affect his as well. So he's aware of this. And it's all in context. So it's really useful when you're remote to communicate this way. Again, you can record work in progress on issues in the comments. And here, for example, I had a conversation over three days with Renat about a particular problem, but it wasn't a high priority issue. So it was nice to have a conversation asynchronously, no rush, and it worked really well for that. Um, so next up is Confluence, which is great for collaborating on content that isn't code in particular. Um, so let me show you recently how I use Confluence to get help for me on a tricky architectural issue I was having with a story I was working on. So I couldn't come up with an acceptable I couldn't come up with an acceptable solution for my story. And I created this page to ask for help when my team in Sydney was offline, where I pretty much outlined what I thought should happen with this solution. And I highlighted some points that were problems with that as well. And again, I used that mentions. I only asked Brad and Guido, who you met earlier, for their opinion on this. And it means that when they come in in the morning, they can see, OK, Adam needs some help. And they can add some comments in here. And here we can see that Brad has pointed out that I should use this particular bridging pattern, which fixes my problem so that when I come online the next morning, I'm unblocked and I get my stuff done. Another way in which we use Confluence, I mentioned before, is for things like reference guides. Um, so this is the guide I wrote for unit testing in my team. Um, but obviously, uh, developers are very opinionated on unit testing and this kind of stuff. Um, so here you can see that after I created this guide and shared it with my team, people had comments back and forth over which mocking framework to use but if we should use BDD. But the nice thing about this is that I'm totally a part of the conversation, even though I'm remote. Um, and I find, too, this is actually a much better way of having this conversation than everyone being together in a meeting room and shouting at each other. Um, so yeah, it's really good for that. And finally, uh, if you don't know what Bitbucket is, you probably know GitHub, which offers similar functionality. Um, here is a pull request you can create. Um, you can push new commits to it. You can add comments, approve, unapprove, all the usual good stuff. Uh, again, you have app mentions as well. So in the context of a pull request view, I can bring attention to Brad and Guido to a particular aspect of my pull request. Um, so I'm remote, but it's, it's really powerful for that. It works really well. And of course, you can discuss code as well because it's a pull request review tool. Um, so yeah, here you can see Guido has said, oh, there's an null pointer exception. So yeah, I can fix that. So all this works seamlessly when you're remote. Uh, one last thing I will say about communication in a team, async especially uh, when you're remote, it's, this, this is actually really important. And that's to lean towards over-communication over under-communication. And what I mean by this is that if you have an important message or something that's important for a team member to know, don't just use one technique to get the message across. Uh, for example, it happened to me a couple of months ago where me, me and a teammate worked on the same thing for three days unbeknownst to each other. We duplicated work because I had assigned a new task to me. Mark is in progress. He didn't check that. And we wasted time, basically. And yeah, so I find that people don't really pay attention to one form of, of message. 
you have to send them an, maybe an email or use HipChat as well or something else just to really get the message across because people don't check these things. Um, so it may, go, it may go against your don't repeat yourself instincts as a developer, but communication is not coding. So getting the message through is the most important thing. OK, so I'm taking a step back to asynchronous, the old-fashioned way. There is less of this when you're remote or in a geo-distributed team, uh, but sometimes you have to have one-on-one -on -one chats that are really good. Um, so yeah, for this, you can use Skype or Google Hangouts. There's loads of mature tools out there. Me and my team use HipChat or HipChat Video. Um, here's how it looks, and it works really well for us. Um, but group meetings, which are just old-fashioned meetings, they still happen when you're remote as well. And so for this, in the last scene, we use blue jeans for the software side of things, and we use life size for the VC harbor in the actual offices. And here's how it looks. And it works really well, even with slow connections, actually. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. But, but there are some things to consider when you're attending meetings remotely as well that are different to when you're in person in an office. And the first thing to consider with this is, and my, my advice to you on this, is to have a fallback way of communicating with the team members in the meeting. Because if the sound stops working or whatever, then it's not very nice to have to do hand signals just saying, hey, can I hear you, and all that hassle. Just have a fallback. Just do it by text, by chat, um, to fix that quickly. Make sure your light is, is good. So when I first started working remotely my, in my apartment, the light was behind my head. And it was the morning time. It was dark outside. So my team could only see kind of a black outline of my face. It's not very conducive to natural conversation. Um, so the best thing to do is to have a natural light behind the camera facing your face if possible. Uh, it's really good to have a rule in a meeting that only one conversation happens at a time. Because the problem is that if there's multiple conversations happening, say in the meeting room, everyone on the remote side of things hears garbled noise. Um, that sucks, obviously. So it's an important rule to have in meetings. Uh, this one's interesting. So it's really important to interrupt as if you're there in the office. So when you're remote, there's a tendency to be extra shy. Maybe it's just a slight bit of lag, I'm not sure. But yeah, it's something to, to overcome. And just if someone is talking and they're saying something that's obviously wrong, don't be afraid to go, sorry, sorry, you're wrong, and interrupt them and stop them. And yeah, because it's always good to do that anyway. But because you're remote doesn't mean you shouldn't do any less. This one is actually kind of interesting one. So if you go online, you will find advice which says that you should mute your mic when you're in a VC meeting, because the background noise where you are might interfere with the meeting. But I say don't do that, because it's, it's a kind of a barrier to natural communication. Say, for example, if someone in the meeting room makes a joke and everyone's laughing, it's not the most natural thing in the world for you to go on mute, ha, 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 mute again. It's just not right. It doesn't feel right. Um, so keep it on, and keep the level and the barrier low for natural communication where you can. It can cause problems sometimes. Like one time for me, um, I had my, my noise cancelling headphones on in a VC meeting, and next thing my teammates in Sydney heard this noise, and I, I was like, what, what, what? Apparently it was my fire alarm. I couldn't hear it. They could hear it in Sydney. So yeah, I was like, oh, right, crap, it's me. Yeah, that happens sometimes, um, but it's so rare that it's worth keeping the mic on, I find. Now this one is... It seems so obvious to me now, but when you first start doing your motor, if you have multiple screens, it's not very nice if you talk to someone like this. It's almost rude, actually, or even this as well. Uh, so if you have multiple screens, make sure you face the screen where your team is and make sure the camera is there as well to have a proper face-to-face -face conversation when you're having a remote meeting or that, for, for example, as well. And finally, don't multitask. There's a really, really strong temptation to check your emails or to even do some work uh, when you're in a remote meeting. Um, but don't, because if the meeting is boring or if it's not really applicable to you, then why are you there in the first place? Stop wasting your own time and either be in the meeting or don't. So I think with these seven things to keep in mind, I think your remote meetings will be far more variable. One last thing on communication in a team. Um, there is one thing I noticed happening in the Amsterdam Atlassian office, which is really cool. My team doesn't do this, but they, they, have a, they work a lot with the team in the Philippines, and they're a finance team, and they've set up uh, just a simple monitor and a webcam, and it's pretty much always on. So in the time zone overlap, they laugh and joke together, and they're always conversation. Uh, they're always conversing, I should say. Um, so yeah, it's a really nice thing to do if you have two offices that have to work a lot together. And for this, they use open source Jitsi Tech, and it works really well for them. So staying on a team of remote teams, uh, it's really important to always know your team, especially because when you're remote, the lack of in-person contact reduces the opportunity to really get to know your teammates. And it's important to know your teammates. It's important to build that empathy for each other to work better together. 
And one way to achieve this is to, well, an easy way is to have one-on-one -on -one catch ups. Um, so you, you can't rely on these random office conversations anymore about the weekend or the beer you had last night. Um, so make sure to schedule in catch ups with your teammates, your, your direct teammates if possible, um, just to catch up with what's happening for work stuff in the office, but also their weekends or what they saw in the movies last night, this kind of stuff, just to keep the connection with you and your teammates. Another way of doing this is to share your own life. Um, so I share blog posts with my team on my life in the Netherlands every so often, and it keeps the connection strong between me and my team because they know what's happening, and we can discuss it in one-on-one -on -one chats or when I'm there in the office as well. And speaking of which, the most important thing when you're working on a team remotely is to not be remote sometimes. So a quick question, who here works on a distributed team and has never met your teammates? Show of hands, anybody? <laughs> One, maybe, yeah. Okay. Well, you should, because it makes it much easier to get angry with them. <laughs> it's true. Um, for example, for me, when I first went remote, uh, in the five months between when I first left Sydney and went back for a work visit, the team doubled in size. So all of a sudden, I had all these new faces on HipChat and Confluence, and I knew the name, but I couldn't put a face to them. I couldn't, per I couldn't put a personality to them. So I didn't know how to challenge them or how, how to have a debate with them. I didn't know if they were shy or angry or whatever else. Um, so after I went to Sydney, had a few beers with them, it makes this much, much easier. So it is really good idea to actually go meet your team in person uh, as often as you can or as often as your company allows. Okay, so a quick recap on remote teamwork. Um, there are tools to make this possible for async communication with your team. Choose the ones that work for you and don't be afraid to repeat yourself to get your message across. For video and VC, be present in the meeting and keep in mind things like the lighting and the facing the camera and that kind of stuff too, and that'll work well for you. And finally, empathy is super important to work well with your team, so try and catch up with your team often, make an extra effort because you aren't there in person, and try and be there in person uh, when you can as well. Okay, so that concludes working in a remote team. And now I'll bring you to the most interesting part for developers probably, which is the rough cycle of or life cycle of how I build software remotely. Um, I'll describe a typical sprint from planning to retros and pretty much everything in between as well, and how I do this remotely. So the first thing in any sprint, before it starts usually, is sprint planning. Um, so my team doesn't do this in a strictly agile way. We don't have a product owner, so we just pretty much add sort and assign tasks in this meeting. I still haven't found a good way to do this asynchronously, so it's my main meeting of the week, VC meeting. Here's how it looks. Um, this is our sprint planning, bright and early on a Monday morning for me. It's Monday evening for Sydney. Uh, the tool we use for this is Jira Software, which I showed you earlier. And it works just as well in a distributed team as a co-located one because it's web-based. And yeah, so join our planning. We just have this screen up, and we create, assign, divide tasks, and one person drives it, and that's pretty much it. Sometimes we do estimating, and for this, we, do pl we use planning poker. And, and to do planning poker with remote members, we use a hip chat add-on called Planning with Cards. It's also a website as well. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty simple thing where each person joins a planning session uh, via hip chat. Each person votes, it collates the votes, and then it shows you the results, and then you go again or not. And it, yeah, it's pretty simple, and it works well for us. So now during your, your sprint, you'll be having stand-ups every morning, I assume. Um, and you may think these have to be synchronous, so did I when I was first remote, um, but not necessarily, actually. So you can do it via VC, um, synchronously, the old-fashioned way for me as well, um, but it's also possible to do it via chat. Um, so I switched teams. I switched to a different Sydney team about two months ago, and in my new team, we decided to do our stand-ups via chat uh, using HipChat, and it actually works really well, especially with time zone differences. So here's how it looks. Um, it's another HipChat add-on. So th this add-on for HipChat is called Standup Report. And when it's installed, you can type in slash standup. It's yesterday I did this, and today I'm going to do this. And that's pretty much it. I do it at the, at the end of my day. And my team come in in their morning, and they do it when they start work as well. And yeah, it's as simple as that. And then our team can come along, and he can get a nice um, summarized view of everybody's standard reports like this. And that's it. Uh, I actually prefer this now to in-person standups. I think even if I was in office for the team, I'd still use this technique because I find the problem with stand-ups in an office where it's uh, people in a circle meeting is that 
It normally happens when the last person comes in. And if you come in earlier than them, you're waiting an hour or two hours for your stand-up, and it breaks up your morning. Whereas this technique, everyone comes in, stand-up report, and then start working for the rest of the morning. And it's one less meeting to have. So now the actual grunt work of the sprint, which is coding. Um, I'll start with a fact on this when you're remote. You have long stretches of focus time, and this means that your coding is actually so much more enjoyable. In fact, it's fucking awesome. It's probably the most enjoyable aspect of being a remote developer. Uh, these long periods of total focus are like nirvana for a developer. It's really, really nice. Um, but it also means that you have a new problem that you encounter, um, which for me was a new thing, which is that you can burn your brain out too quickly on a typical day because there's no distractions. Um, so to manage this, I use a technique called the Pomodoro technique, which is a, it's a time management philosophy invented by a guy called Francesco Cirillo in the late 80s. He's Italian, hence the name Pomodoro. Um, and here's how it works. You do a slice of work for 25 minutes. It's an atomic piece of work. You can't interrupt that, and you're totally focused in that time. And after that, you take a five-minute break, um, play with the cat, have a cup of tea, um, have a bathroom break, then do another cycle of work and break again and again. After four cycles of work, you have a 15-minute break, a longer break, and that's pretty much it. It's as simple as that. Each section here is called a Pomodoro. Taking these frequent breaks has some surprising effects. First of all, I find that my coding ability stays much higher for longer. Uh, there's no 3 p.m. slump with this. I uh, generally smash through code. But also, these breaks as well give me perspective on the problem I'm trying to solve. Um, so you have a lot more of those toilet light bulb moments where you're, working, you're playing with your cat, but in the background, your brain is still processing the task you're working on. And you just go, ah, that's what I have to do. Um, it's, it kind of promotes more of these occasions to happen, which is a really good thing. And finally, um, there are plenty of tools out there where you can track how many Pomodoros a particular task took. Um, so that means that if you have a similar task in the future, you know, OK, this thing was similar, and it took me 25 Pomodoros or whatever, and it's good for estimating as well. So still on coding, but this time with pair programming, um, it is possible to pair remotely. I don't do this every day, only on difficult problems, usually in my team. Uh, and there are a few different tools out there for this, such as Screen Hero or Cloud9, a cloud-based IDE. Uh, but the one my team and I use is called Flubits. Flubits is really nice because it has a number of editors directly for different plugins. Um, so let me show you a quick example of me pairing an idea with my cat, Tommy, on the bottom, uh, using Adam on different computers, different MacBooks. So oops, let me go back. Yeah. So on top, it's, it's IDE, it's idea, and on the bottom, it's Adam. And here we go. So we're working on this international phone number at last. And I see that we have got another check for our constructor arg, so I add that in. Tommy's editor is updated automatically as well. Tommy sees that I forgot a static import, so he puts that in for me. And that fixes my compile error. It's all really nice. But Tommy's a bit of a young developer, and he thinks that this null check is actually overkill. Uh, he thinks it's too much of a nuisance, so he wants to get rid of it. But I disagree with that, and I want to show him why it's a bad thing to remove it. So I ask him to follow me. So Tommy clicks in follow mode. Now that means that wherever I click in my editor, uh, Tommy gets scrolled to that position automatically. So I can point out things to him in code, like where potential null pointer exceptions would be, which is really useful. So I've convinced Tommy, and we put it back in the null pointer exception check. So I want to teach Tommy a lesson on the value of defensive programming, so I decided to share an article with him about this as well, using Flubit's built-in chat. So chat works across all the editors as well, very simple. Uh, Tommy doesn't care about this because he thinks he knows everything. He's a young developer. <laughs> but I, no I noticed there's something wrong with our code style as well. The code doesn't match our code style, so I've got to fix that up. An idea. And you can see it's automatically updated in Tommy's code, too. Tommy doesn't agree with this, and he thinks that his code has been ruined by this. <laughs> but that's a quick example of how you can pair remotely and how it works pretty seamlessly as well, especially if you have video chat happening at the same time. And so besides this, it has some other features, too, Flubits. Uh, it supports other editors like Sublime Text, Emacs, and the U of M. It doesn't support Eclipse, so that might stop a lot of you using it, but we use Idea at Atlassian. 
Um, it has built-in video chat. We don't use this. We use Skip Chat Video, which works just as well, but you can use this. Uh, it also has terminal sharing, which is really, really cool too, where you get the same thing but for your terminal. Um, so that's really nice as well. Just last week, I used Fluebits to pair with uh, one of our front-end specialists in Sydney to fix a particularly bad backbone property problem we were having. I'm not a front-end expert, um, so it really helped with that too. It's really powerful for that. It's not free, but I do think it's worth it. So next up is code review. I hope you all do code reviews where you work. Uh, we certainly do in my team. Um, to do code reviews in a distributed team, you have to have tools. A tool like Bitbucket you see here, or Fishlight Crucible, or GitHub is vital, or GitLab. Uh, you can't do over-the-shoulder code reviews when you're remote, uh, but once you are using one of these tools, then code reviews work pretty much the same as when you're in the same office as well. One nice extra benefit of a time zone difference when you're in a distributed team is that when I'm awake during the day, I do create my code, create my pull requests, then I finish work, go to bed. My team in Sydney can review that code, which means that when I come in the next morning, I have all my feedback there. I'm not waiting for it. And it kind of means that there's more hours in a 24-hour day where your code is being reviewed and it's been written as well. That cycle becomes shorter because of that. So it's a really nice extra benefit from that. And so finally, retrospectives. Um, these are typically done after a sprint is done. And normally, they're a meeting room where everyone's in there, and you just all say what went well, what didn't go well. Um, but there is a good way to do these with remote members as well. And it's with using a new add-on coming soon to Conference Cloud called Better Retros. We're dogfooding it internally at Atlassian right now, and my team is using it. So I'll give you a quick sneak preview of how that works and how my team use that. So once you have the add-on installed, you create this new Better Retros page, and um, then you get the page created like this, and you share this page with each member of your development team. Uh, each member then adds what they think worked well and what didn't work well. So it works just as well when you're remote or in a meeting room, which is really nice when you're remote especially. And then you merge any duplicates you find. And then each person, again, individually votes on what they think are the most important items that have been brought up by the retro. Once everyone's finished their voting, you create the most important thing from Retro, which are your action items, typically for the most voted items in the Retro. And once everyone has created their action items, then it exports to this nice page in Confluence, which you can share with your wider team as well. So it works really nicely when you're remote because you're totally a part of it, and it's using tools, and it's all seamless. And yeah, it's a good substitute for being in a VC meeting. So that concludes my talk on my section on coding remotely. Um, so a quick recap on this. We're lucky to work in an industry where there are no barriers to fully working remotely in the software industry for sure. Uh, all the steps are possible remotely, um, so you can do this. As with communication in the team, the tools are really, really important, and there are plenty of awesome tools out there, not just the lasting ones for this, uh, to help at all phases of the, of the dev process. And finally, being asynchronous actually helps for certain things, like stand-ups, like I mentioned, definitely with coding, and also with code review as well. These things can actually work better remotely. That concludes pretty much my talk. Um, before we all go have a beer or some cocktails, I have some key takeaways for you guys. First up is when you work from home, you're at work. So don't be doing housework all day and keep your work areas separate. Taking care of your physical and mental well-being is always important, but when you're remote, you do face different challenges, so keep this in mind. Lean towards over-communication when you're remote, and don't assume others know what you're doing. That's really important to keep in mind as well. Now, I mentioned async comms. They can actually be more effective than, sync, than meetings, for example, uh, especially for highly technical discussions. And there are tools out there to make remote comms work, so find the ones that work for you and your team and get them. And finally, building the empathy with your teammates is really vital. So yeah, make the extra effort when you're remote to get to know them and go meet them in person as well. Not finally, just three more, but yeah. Uh, yeah, sprint planning has to be synchronous. Stand-up doesn't. So that's my experience. If you found a way to do sprint planning asynchronously and you're remote, I would love to hear it after the talk or in the questions, for example, as well. The Pomodoro technique is really awesome for coding, and yeah, it's that's pretty much it. It it's really helps you to stay fresh for longer, so I recommend that. And finally, um, pairing retros, 
can work totally effectively with the right tools when you're remote. Being remote is not a barrier for these things. So I hope today I've either encouraged you to consider a remote role for your current or future job, or if you're hiring and building a team, maybe I've convinced you to think about hiring remote workers as well. So on that, we have a few minutes, so any questions? Hi, so as someone who's working remotely, what advice can you give to the people who are in the office to enable the remote workers? <laughs> Good question. Uh, most important piece of advice I can think of is to not exclude someone just because they're remote, because it's such a natural tendency to assume someone isn't there because you don't see them in person. It's like almost a natural mental state to be in as a human being where you don't see someone physically day to day. And it's happened quite a few times, especially in the first few months when I was remote, that there would be an important discussion that I should have been involved in, but I was forgotten about, um, or stuff like that as well. So I think if you're in an office, then it's important to, to keep in mind you have remote members. I think from my situation, it's kind of unusual because I'm the only one person that's remote. I think if you're in a team where there's multiple remote members, it's easier to keep them in mind. But yeah, but that is, that is if, you're, if you're in an office, that's the most important thing, I would say. Any more? Hello. I just would like to know how you manage potential conflicts with your <laughs> team being uh, in another uh, time zone remote. <laughs> uh, that's a funny question, actually, because when I first went remote, I was actually a team lead, and I went back to being a developer a few months later. And in the first few months, I had conflict on my team, and being a remote team lead just doesn't work. Don't even try that. I would never do it again. But I've never encountered conflict since I've been remote, um, only in pull request reviews. But even then, I mean, there's no assholes at last scene. My team doesn't have any assholes on it, so all the conversations are usually pretty amicable. Um, so I've never actually encountered a proper um, confrontation being remote, so it hasn't been a problem for me. So, yeah. Sorry, that synchronous code thing, I kept completely missing what it was called. The asynchronous, you mean the pair programming tool? Yeah. Uh, flu bits. Let me go back to the slide that has the... Yeah, it's, it's not free, but it's, it's a really, really good tool to use. Um, give me one sec. Here we go. Yeah, flu bits. That's what, that's what it's called. So take a picture. Any more questions? Don't be greedy, one more question. Yeah. Um, we, um, we use Slack rather than HipChat, but I think you may have the same problem with us in that uh, over time there are more and more channels that you're in and you end up with a, uh, 50 million channels and it's really hard to keep focus on the ones that are important. Mm -hmm. How do you manage that? Well, first of all, HipChat doesn't have public channels like Slack does, so that limits the problem. It makes it a smaller problem straight away. And also, I mean, it's almost like subscribing to email threads or everybody else. It's like you can watch a million pages in Confluence. You can watch a million things online. It's all about managing the funnel into your, your time, basically. And for HipChat, I keep a minimum number of rooms open. If that room isn't relevant to me anymore, I close it, which means that I don't get notifications anymore. Um, it does mean that if someone that mentions me in that room when I'm not a member, then I get notified and I can go back into that room later on. But I basically close rooms that I'm not actively involved in, and that helps the problem. So, yeah. But it doesn't have the public channel problem you mentioned before, so, yeah. So, any more questions, or is that it? No? Okay, um, here's the stuff I used in my talk, lots of images. Uh, yeah, and feel free to grab me afterwards for a chat about any of this stuff. I'm around today and tomorrow as well. And other than that, yeah, thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference and have a good night.
Cheers.